through our sector special event. And as you know, we are recording that, as you just heard. So we um, will talk a little bit about that as well. But um, this meeting takes place and uh, takes the place of our normal monthly sector meeting. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And are really excited to have Sean Brock, who is the Associate Director of the Whole Child for Whole Child Health, sharing with us today. And I hope I know that you all will enjoy hearing from Sean and then getting to have um, some discussion with him as well. So our agenda for the day is on the slide and we'll include our speakers and then we're gonna have an opportunity to discuss next steps for our school sector and really how we can work together to promote the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan strategies in school settings. That is a, um, you know, our big goal really to how do we work together to move more, right? Get everybody moving more and what does that look like too? And so, but before we get started, I do want to share a few housekeeping reminders. We ask that you would include your name and also, um, if you can, where you're from with us this afternoon um, with your, on your image. If you're not sure how to do that, um, it's the three little dots at the top, just on the left hand, you can click them down and I think it lets you rename um, if you'd like to include some of that information as well. We do ask that you mute yourself during the presentation to avoid echoes and background noise. If you're like me, I have my window open, uh, enjoying this pretty day we're having in the Kansas City area, but I will mute <laughs> when I'm done here. You uh, also may want to consider changing your view to presenter view, um, and, and so you can see the person speaking, so you'll be able to see Sean along with the slides. We will have the presentation available both as slides and as a recording. As you know, we're recording this presentation, but you'll be able to we'll be able to share that afterwards too. And especially if you have to step away for a little bit and miss any pieces of it. Um, there's closed caption is also a new option that's available to all participants. You may need to select that option in your own Zoom to be able to enter to enable it if you want it to be available. Uh, before we begin this afternoon, though, I do want to remind everyone that tomorrow we'll be having the 2022 Kansas City Physical Activity Summit. So that summit is for all the sectors, and we're going to be bringing in great um, feedback, and we're going to hear from speakers and want to encourage everybody to join us for that. If you're able, Katie's inserting the link um, for us to do that as well, uh, if you haven't already um, reserved your spot or signed up, I should say. It's not really reserving a spot. We just would love to see you there tomorrow as well. And today, what we're going to really be focusing is what works in schools, supporting healthy school sector strategies. And that's going to be presented by Sean. And I'm not sure if you all got to see or read his um, information, but in Sean's role, he supports a variety of content areas, including tobacco-free districts, family and community engagement, federal school wellness programs, um, both, uh, I should say, policy, uh, federal school wellness policy regulations, and then physical activity, physical education, uh, whole child health, and staff wellness at both school and out of school time sites. Lots of different things there <laughs> that he is involved in and knows a lot about. So Sean helps schools and districts identify strengths and challenges, provides expertise on creating and implementing action plans, to close the gaps and support school and district personnel in creating healthier environments for staff and students. Sean previously worked for Healthier Generation as the National Physical Education and Physical Activity Advisor on the Let's Move Active Schools initiative. And in his career, Sean has served in the K-12 education as a teacher, school administrator, district supervisor, and a state coordinator overseeing K-12 programming for health uh, for health, physical education, and wellness. And we're really excited to have Sean here to help pres to present on what strategies work in school settings to increase physical activity. And Sean, I will pass it on to you. Well, thank you so much, Robin. I do appreciate that. And yeah, you're mentioning nice weather there. And I'm just at the opposite end of that because I'm in Florida. So we're uh, in the midst of a hurricane going across the state now. So um, yeah, so we're doing okay for right now, but hopefully we don't lose any power or anything. But um, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. All right, perfect.
All right. So as Robin mentioned, just wanted to uh, really appreciate the invite to be part of this great work that you've got going on in uh, Kansas City and really just lend some ideas and some thoughts of, you know, what we've learned in our organization and our work uh, around uh, physical activity and specifically around a comprehensive school physical activity program. And just to share with you some some specific thoughts, ideas, resources, what we've seen success in uh, and some areas that we're still working on that, you know, certainly need some improvement. So just to get you started today, I want you to think about, you know, really where we've been in education over the past, you know, 100 years. And uh, I want you to imagine that one room schoolhouse. And, you know, you may be picturing, you know, something that looks like this with a desk in those nice little neat rows and students with their head in the book and the teacher sitting at the kind of the back of the classroom monitoring everything. And then I want you to compare that to what a classroom looks like today. And unfortunately, in some schools, things may have not changed very much. And if students are expected to stay sedentary for hours a day, you know, planted in their seats, you know, the result may be, you know, what, what you see here. Um, now, I want you to think about, you know, a learning environment, a whole school-wide uh, environment that incorporates movement. So as students enter the door, uh, they're automatically greeted by their teacher and they start with an instant activity or possibly a, a social studies teacher at the high school level that's going through a geography lesson where kids are moving to different parts of the classroom to correspond with different geographic regions. Or you walk down to the uh, gymnasium and you see a physical education class with all students that are actively, you know, participating. So, you know, I ask you, you know, which classroom, which school kind of environment really appeals to you? That old photo from decades ago of that one room schoolhouse, the ones with the, the students sleeping on the desk or, you know, a more active uh, classroom environment. So that's really our challenge, right, is, is to kind of create, you know, more active learning environments where movement is the norm, not really the exception. And when we first started planning for this meeting, again, I was excited to be to be involved with it, learn more about uh, the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan and the great work that's going on. So I just really want to kind of use today as an opportunity to kind of add some best practices again and, and possibly some solutions uh, around teacher and student engagement because it still comes down to people and you could have the greatest uh, uh, policies in the world. You could really have a lot of great uh, resources in place, but it still takes people uh, to make that happen and really um, identify some ideas uh, to support the the sector, uh, the healthy school sector strategies. And with our organization, we've been around since 2005 at the Alliance for a Healthier Generation and physical education, physical activity has really been uh, one of our mainstays of the areas that we work on in uh, whole child health. And we were, again, uh, supported Let's Move Active Schools um, several years ago, where we solely focused on uh, CSPAP and physical education, physical activity. And now we've uh, branched out and embraced the whole child education model, where we're taking a more integrated approach uh, to whole child health. So when we think about and look at the three strategies that you have for the healthy school sector strategy, looking at that comprehensive school physical activity program, um, professional development, you know, I think is a very unique area that we're going to spend a little bit of time on today because I think it holds, you know, the opportunity to advance uh, not only the physical education field, but just physical activity in general and the acceptance of, of physical education and physical activity on a more integrated and school wide approach. And that last piece about, you know, development developing and advocating for, for policies that really help to, to promote the great work. So, to, you know, let's talk a little bit about to get started, you know, this the concept of having a school uh, physical activity program and really the model just to kind of develop a, a shared understanding, you know, of the intent, the purpose, the language uh, that's really behind the, the CSPAP model. So I'm sure you're all familiar, you know, with the model that that guides again the work that you have going on uh, with the physical activity plan. And this was developed by Shape America and and by uh, CDC as part of their coordinated school health approach. And it's really about this kind of multi-component approach, and it really sets aside and identifies all the different areas that students have to be active. Uh, at a school based environment. And we know that best practices say, hey, we need to get, you know, at least a minimum of 60 minutes of physical activity uh, each day. Um, and 
you know, I think probably one of the big takeaways that, you know, if any of you work in the physical education field is that physical education is really thought of to be the foundation or the cornerstone where students learn, you know, those skills and that knowledge where they can take and apply in other areas of uh, physical activity and other areas of the CSPAP components. So, um, you know, again, we've used this framework really to kind of guide our work and we've had great success with schools and districts across the country recognizing their efforts, uh, either with the Let's Move Active Schools Award um, or with our uh, new uh, America's Healthiest Schools Award. Um, however, I will say that, you know, there's certain components of CSPAP that have been a challenge to make progress in. Uh, certainly, we've made greater strides across the country and in, in schools uh, in certain components, and some have been a challenge. So just kind of, again, to get your thoughts and see what, you know, just very interested in your perspective, I'm going to use a tool called Mentimeter. And you can go to www.menti.com, use that code at the top of the screen. And I would just be interested in your thoughts around, you know, what do you perceive to be the most challenging component of CSPAP when we talk about, you know, physical, uh, physical education programs, physical activity before and after school, uh, physical activity during school, um, staff involvement or family and community engagement. So if you can go ahead and vote now, and hopefully this works. Anyone have any issues using it? Is it coming up? I'm getting it to come up, but I'm getting a question to ask, choose one Olympic sport. Did anybody else get that or is that just me? <laughs> um, well, let me see. Or maybe I typed in the number on it. I'm getting the same thing. Same okay. thing? This could be a user error. Just give me one minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got the same thing. And then it's asking me for another Olympic sports. So it's just Olympic sports nonstop. All right. Well, um, since we're coming off mute, let's go ahead and um, just continue with that. What, um, what do we think is the most challenging component of CSPAP? Or you can type in, feel free to type in the chat box. If you had to say where you think that schools would, would struggle the most typically, what would you, what would you say? Family. Yeah, family and community engagement. Certainly, um, we're seeing that as a as an area um, where it's hard to get families engaged and um, community involvement as well. And, and I think a lot of that, you know, stems from you know there being kind of a misunderstanding of what physical education is, what physical activity is, and what does it mean to have a to have an active environment. So certainly. Uh, family engagement is certainly one of those areas that I was speaking on that, you know, we haven't seen as much progress in that area uh, compared to an area, uh, say, as, you know, integrating more movement during the school day, which seems to really have resonated uh, a little bit more with, with educators. Um, so I apologize for the Mentimeter thing. We'll try it again because I think that was the, the second slide. But let me uh, put this um, as something new um, to go along with CSPAP. So the whole school, whole community, whole child model um, was developed by ACD uh, along with the CDC um, several years ago. And really the thought behind this model is that this is more of an integrated approach, uh, really with a student at the middle and it's became even highlighted and more evident where we've been with the pandemic over the last several years, where we know that if students' basic needs aren't being met, it's very difficult for learning to occur. Um, and then as we look at kind of these 10 components of what we call the WISC model, um, you know, we're saying that physical education, physical activity, certainly directly connected with nutrition uh, envir uh, environment, that we know that those two things go hand in hand, that also we know that there's a 
whole mental health component uh, and social emotional uh, piece that goes with physical education, physical activity. So this is really a, a way to kind of show this more integrated approach. Again, taking a more student uh, centered approach where students really are at the focus and at the, the forefront of everything we do. How can we bring them into the conversation um, as far as you know what works best for them? So this is kind of really showing and kind of highlighting more of a collaborative approach to learning and health, which I think you know, all of us in the physical education, physical activity, child health field have really embraced um, because again, it shows that we're not really operating in silos uh, because for many years as a physical education teacher, I would always just feel so removed being down the gym, down in physical education land. I really didn't know what was going on in the rest of the building. And I think this gives us more of an opportunity to show those connections, you know, that we're always looking for that. Yeah, healthier students are going to do better in school. Um, so people always ask, all right, okay, well, what does that mean for CSPAP? And how do the two fit together? And I'm kind of waiting on ASCD or CDC or uh, someone to really kind of mesh these two together. But I think the best way to really think about this is really think about the WISC as that whole child model. So it's the larger model. And then when you go to that component, physical education, physical activity, if you could open that up, well, there would CSPAP be, because that's more of the framework for the planning and the organizing of activities specifically around this component. So I, I think if you uh, approach it from that standpoint, that yeah, physical education is certainly part of the, the larger school environment. Physical activity, it's important to integrate physical activity with the other nine components. But if I just wanna focus on that one specific area, then here's CSPAP, because this is going to really show me where those opportunities exist throughout the school day to, to kind of integrate movement. And if you go back and you really think about the goals of CSPAP, you know, which is to provide a variety of school-based physical activities, you know, to enable all students to get that 60 minutes. And then it's also to really coordinate uh, amongst those five uh, components as well. Uh, for example, you know, family and community engagement. Is there a way that I can connect what I'm doing in my physical education class with families, with communities? Because when you have that type of uh, collaboration, then the opportunity for success is going to be, be so much higher. So I think one important piece to kind of pull out automatically and uh, this is a, a piece that's still getting in the way because I can't tell you the number of times that I've been to, to school sites and uh, to provide uh, in-person professional learning. And I always like to start uh, in the administration office in the front office and, and start with a, an administrator, just to ask them, you know, hey, tell me about your physical education program. How's it going? And some of the answers I'd get, well, you know, Sean, we've got a great physical education program here. You know, our boys basketball team was in the state playoffs uh, for the three years in a row. And, you know, we've got a great PE program. Or, you know, I would get the opposite end of, well, let's go down there and see. We've got a great physical education program. You know, all the kids are running around. They're having a great time. You know, there wasn't a fight in the locker room. Nobody broke their arm out on the playground. We've got a great PE program. So I think really there's a, a large misunderstanding across the educational world about what physical activity is, what physical education is, and then throw in athletics and sports. And when I talk about physical activity, you're talking about things like recess, you're talking about um, classroom physical activity breaks, it may be a school-wide physical activity break. But it could be a structured, it could be unstructured, but really we're talking about movement. Um, when we talk about physical education, now we're talking about that specific academic content area that's school-based, that's instructional in nature. It's based on state standards and national standards. And the goal of physical education is to de develop physical literacy. And we talk about reading literacy and, and uh, numer uh, literacy with math. Uh, physical literacy, being a competent, confident mover is the goal of any quality physical education program. And then you throw in sports, athletics, uh, which is, first of all, I'll say it's voluntary. Uh, students, youth are taking their own time to participate in sports. It's competitive by nature. Uh, it's extracurricular. It's in addition to things outside the school day. And it's divided up into individual sports, team sports. And a lot of times you see 
these three terms kind of mesh together that um, everyone in the community may think that physical education is directly related to the basketball program, to the football program. And we know that's totally opposite, um, that physical education is, is really that school-based instructional piece. So, you know, I, I think no matter what your role is here uh, today, I think helping to promote this message that there is a difference uh, is really fundamental to, to making strides and making gains in, in this area. So when we talk about, you know, CSPAP, you know, what does it look like? What is, you know, what does success look like? And several years ago, we took a, a large undertaking in the state of West Virginia to provide uh, a big movement around integrating movement into classrooms. So that looks like, you know, taking a physical activity break or integrating content, you know, with movement and provided many trainings and, and just looking for some success stories and some things that, you know, that kind of went well, that really kind of, you know, gave us an idea of, yeah, we're making a difference because the things that we're doing in, in training and professional learning is getting put into practice. And I received an email from the teacher, the picture at the top. And she said that, you know, she had been teaching for about seven or eight years, and she was really ready to kind of get out of it. She was uh, having a very difficult time with classroom management and kids not being on task. Uh, she came to our training, their, their whole school staff did. Um, they started this push around integrating movement. And she said that worked, but she said she got to looking at it a little bit deeper and she got uh, interested in using different um, ideas for furniture, for, for using the stability balls, the yoga balls, um, the pedal desk, different type of kinesthetic movement um, pieces of furniture in her classroom because she said that she didn't realize, you know, how many, you know, if you don't give students a physical activity break, they make their own physical activity breaks because they are constantly asking to get up, to go sharpen a pencil, to throw something away, uh, fidgeting in their desk, uh, wanting to, you know, to go out to use the restroom. Um, so she had a fitness center donated these uh, stability balls. And she said she started small. She kind of left them in the corner and let students kind of voluntarily choose uh, to sit on uh, these uh, stability balls at their desk. And of course, when it first started, all of our colleagues said, you know, that's never going to work. Those things are going to be all over the place. Um, but she said, you know, after a couple of weeks, it no longer became this unique you know, deal in her class, it was kind of everyone was, you know, that was interested in doing it was using the st stability balls. And she said it just helped students to focus because it kind of got the wiggles out. And it really kind of allowed them to kind of move around without distracting the rest of the class. And she said she's having the best year that she's ever had in education. And then a couple of weeks later, she sends me a newspaper article from a community college that was there in town. And uh, her article ran in the newspaper and a local community college, one of the professors there saw her story and he implemented the same type of concept with his community college students. And again, I thought, well, this is a great, you know, kind of real life story of how one teacher, that person, that individual that it takes to make change took a small idea that she was interested in and really it kind of spread to the community, spread to another organization. And the principal at the, at the school from the, uh, at the top photo, you know, he developed his own professional learning community uh, around these concepts. And, you know, they would get new teachers in or they would get teachers in that kind of struggled with ideas. And what was her third grade classroom eventually turned into everybody on her team on the third grade wing uh, now had a classroom that looked like this and integrated movement. And it, it again, it kind of spiraled from there and took on, you know, a whole professional learning community that they could use um, in their team meetings. So I think that's an example of, you know, what does it look like to be successful? And some of the tips, you know, that I think I've found that that really work is that you have to remind schools and districts, teachers constantly that there's no one size fits all approach. You know, we know that schools could be in the same school district, in the same city, city. they could be across the street from each other and they're different school environments. It's totally different. You walk in the front door, there's just a different feel. There's just a different environment. So I think just kind of meeting schools where they're at, telling them to 
pick something that works for them because that idea of integrating, you know, those types of activities and that type of furniture, it may not work everywhere and that's okay. And I think that it's what I've kind of embraced is that, yeah, it really is unique because someone that you're saying has got a, you know, a very comprehensive and successful uh, school physical activity program going it could look totally different from someone else. And, you know, I, I mentioned assessment here and, you know, I'm, I really mean some method of collecting information about where you're at right now. You know, we use, uh, we created what's called the Thriving Schools Integrated Assessment, which measures, you know, kind of gives you a, an idea of where you're at in all those components of the whole child health model. So what method are you using to really collect some information about, what you're doing well and, and probably where you need to focus some of your attention and really using it more of a, a needs assessment. Again, utilizing the physical education staff Again, they're the individuals on campus that really have that, you know, background uh, to help out in this area and to assume some type of leadership role. Uh, but it may not necessarily be. It may be just finding someone on that campus that has that love of movement and know uh, how much of a benefit it can be for students. You know, I, I think when you're thinking about uh, comprehensive school physical activity programs, you know, the biggest thing is there's got to be a variety. We got to meet the needs of all the students, got to be inclusive of everyone. You know, we got to think about students with uh, with special needs. Um, we got to think about our higher skilled kids, our lower skilled kids. It really has to be inclusive and it's got to be built for everyone and everyone has to find something that they could be successful in. And um, again, getting support, some buy-in, that has to start at the top with leadership, um, but also it has to be, you know, with, with other educators, with community members, with that family, and probably some of the best uh, things I could, you know, talk about CSPAP is, is really just starting small. You can't just scrap everything that you're doing. You have to start with one idea and kind of build it out from there. All right, so with professional development, um, this is where I wanted to spend a little bit of time because, again, I, I think this area holds a lot of promise for physical activity, physical education. Um, so I just want to ask you a question. You can feel free to come off mute or type it in the chat box. But does anyone know where the 2024 Olympics are going to be? Paris. Ah, yes. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing. Yeah, Paris. I had to kind of look that one up myself. So I figured I would... Uh, put in the uh, Eiffel Tower there is just a little landmark and a little reminder of where the 2024 Olympics are going to be. But when we think about the Olympics, um, I've listed what are kind of nine of the more popular sporting events in Paris. And what I want you to think about is if you had to choose um, one of those Olympic activities to participate in, you had to choose one to participate in, what would it be? And I was going to use Mentimeter for this, but if that's not working, okay, it is working. All right. So go ahead and feel free to choose one of those that if you had to participate in starting today in the 2024 Olympics, uh, what would you decide to participate in? And I've got several people voting, so I appreciate that. Someone asked me in another training, would it be my today self or would it be from myself from 10 years ago? Um, so I said, no, it could be your, your today self. You know, what would you participate in? So we've got weightlifting and track and field switching places here as one and two. Not many for boxing, I can understand. Um, so, yeah, it looks like track and field, weightlifting, cycling, swimming. Uh, cycling has now jumped up to the top. So you chose your, your one sport that you'd had to participate in. But now I want you to think about, you know, why did you select that one sport? Um, what was it about that one sport? So think about the, you know, why you selected and then I just want you to type in, you know, what are a couple of those factors that influence participation in physical activity? So as you think about, you know, what you, um, what was your deciding factor? You know, what was it about weightlifting? What was it about cycling? Why you chose that to participate? 
Yeah, enjoyment and ability. Angela, uh, thank you. They don't have my favorite sport yet, napping. Uh, she shared in the chat box. I could relate to that one. That is a great sport. Yeah, so ability, enjoyment, uh, direct satisfaction, relaxing, lifelong. Yep, great one. Easy to understand. That definitely makes a, a difference. Yeah, I can still do them at the same age. Yeah. Comfortable. That's a good word um, to use. Yep, the environment, maybe, you know, what you're you're used to. Yep, mental health. Yep, there's a tie-in with the physical and the mental aspect of it, making me feel strong. So getting into, again, those we know those physical benefits, but when we also know about those mental benefits, about confidence and, again, uh, increasing your relaxation and being comfortable, you know, things that you can do for a lifetime. So, you know, I, I think that's so important because, you know, how often do we get a chance to ask our students, ask the youth that we're working with, you know, what do they like to do? What do they enjoy? What's fun for them? Because oftentimes I see teachers providing activities that they're comfortable with. And it should be the opposite way around when we talk about taking that more student-centered approach. We should be, you know, looking at students and getting their feedback, getting their input uh, as far as what they like to do if we really want to talk about, you know, participation. Because, again, you're going to choose those activities, you know, that, um, that, you're, that you're comfortable with. And if you go back to that list, if I go back to that list, um, you'll notice that most of these sports are not your uh, team's type of sports. You know, track and field, is, you have the USA track team, but you're competing on an individual basis, the same as, you know, with cycling and boxing. Uh, so a lot of these are more individual-based sports rather than team sports. But one of those misconceptions is that, you know, physical education always has to be about, about team sports. So do we have an issue when we talk about physical education, uh, physical activity participation? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we really do. And I think, again, this holds so much promise because if we can increase young people's interest in physical activity, then the rest of the components of CSPAP are going to take off. They're going to take care of themselves if our clientele, which are our students, can really be interested in and in, in take off and, and participate in a lot of things. Um, and this was from 2019 from the Youth Risk Behavior uh, Survey. And the columns that I'm looking at specifically, you know, are number one, and this is, you know, during the course of a week, how many youth were active? And this one is... Um, uh, on the first column there, it's for a total of 60 minutes per day. And the shading and the light blue, that's the combination of the male and female, it's average. So it's only about 25%. Well, then if you jump over to that fourth column, that is the number of students that attended physical education daily on five days a week. And that number, you know, is about the same, maybe a little bit higher. Um, but, you know, we do have a participation problem with, with young people because typically what you see is at the high school level, they take their one credit or the whatever the state requires in physical education, and then they're out. They, they don't ever go back to, to physical education. And I think a lot of um, thing could be kind of gained from this study because I, I think when you talk about participation, you look at it by males and females, there's also the opportunity, I think, to bring more females um, into the fold to enjoy physical activity and to find things that, uh, you know, they enjoy doing. Um, this last one is, is about playing sports, about playing athletics, how we were talking about that they're different. Um, this last column we'll go, we'll talk about a little bit later on, but if you notice that's much higher, we have, uh, almost 60% of young people that played on at least one sports team during the past 12 months. So again, there's some opportunities there, but when we talk about physical education class, we talk about getting 60 minutes of daily physical activity. Yeah. We're looking at only about 25, 30% of, of youth, uh, are meeting those, those numbers. So when we look at ways um, to increase participation, well, I think we have to understand, you know, what those factors are that go into, you know, why uh, students choose to participate in physical education class, why they choose to participate in a before or after school physical activity offering. And it, it's really 
and you all hit it with the with all the uh, descriptors that you were putting in as far as what are those factors. And it's really about belief in your capability, right? If you don't have confidence and you haven't had success in some type of physical activity, the likelihood of you participating in it is not very good. And, you know, it's, it's about those perceived health and enjoyment. That word came up quite a bit. And, you know, the, the kind of the physical, you know, self-perception, you know, am I as good as other students here? Or do I just need to kind of go sit in the bleachers because I'm not as good and I'm not as skilled as other students uh, that, uh, that I'm going to be asked to participate with? You know, there's social factors, certainly peer influences. You know, I spoke with a, a couple of teachers that were having difficulty with their uh, physical education classes, and they said if they could get friends to help influence their peers, you know, with finding something that they like to do, they've had some great success in, in improving their physical um, education participation. You know, family support, we've already identified. Family engagement is an area that we really need to work on when it comes to physical education, physical activity. And I thought it was interesting. A high quality teacher really makes all the difference. Um, having teachers, again, that structure programs that provide opportunities for young people to have success um, I've almost kind of started calling it success driven physical activity, success driven physical education, because that quality teacher that understands that and can structure their programs, structure their offerings uh, in that way, uh, we're really seeing, you know, they have a, a much better participation rate. And then, of course, environmental factors, you know, access to facilities, safety is always a concern with everything that we do uh, should be at the forefront of all of our programming efforts. And then, of course, uh, weather is certainly uh, an issue as well, you know, when we talk about uh, outdoor physical activities before after school physical activities, those things could be limiting factors as well throughout the course of the year. So there, those are just some factors that, to really think about that go into why young people uh, like to participate, why they don't like to participate. Um, I want to specifically hit on physical education just for a moment because, you know, I think we're seeing some trends in physical education across the country, and it's really moving more towards fitness-based programs over competition. So again, getting away from everything being about basketball, baseball, uh, flag football, softball, great team sports, but the need there, we know that if we're really going to address some of these health-related fitness uh, problems out there uh, with childhood obesity, um, we have to make things more fitness-based to address those health-related components. And again, lifetime activities that came up um, when we were sitting there collecting information. You know, again, if you look at the most popular activities that adults participate in, you're looking at things like going to the gym, walking, uh, participating in uh, some type of fitness class or some type of exercise class. Uh, once you leave high school, the opportunity to you know, participate in basketball, baseball, football really uh, drop significantly. So are we offering those things uh, and building our physical education classes more like the real world, making connections for students and how this is going to help you after you leave um, high school? Uh, we talked about athletics and participation. We know that that was a, a way that um, you know, there, that's a big part of what young people do. But on the other hand, if you take a population of an average size high school in this country is about a thousand students. So if you look at that student body of about a thousand students, only about 15 to 20 percent of them, uh, male, female, play some type of extracurricular uh, interscholastic athletic. I'm not worried about those students. And why is that? Because those students get it, right? Those 15 to 20 percent of kids, they value physical activity. They're taking their own time to go out and participate in physical activity in a sporting event. But my question is, what are we doing for those other 80 to 85% of young people? How are we meeting their needs with physical activity? What are we doing to get them involved and asking them, they evidently don't like team sports or individual sports. They're not taking their time to, to do it. So how else can we hook them so that we're ensuring that they're getting that 60 minutes of, of daily physical activity? And 
you know, anytime you get the opportunity uh, to make connections to academics, you know, I, I think it really only strengthens our cause and really, you know, reinforce that idea that that healthier kids, you know, do better. So here's just a couple of things that I pulled out uh, when we look at schools about you know, whether we're talking about physical education programs, whether we're talking about any type of physical activity program, I think here's a couple of strategies in some areas I kind of divided up into three buckets that we really need to, to look at when we start talking about, you know, wanting to increase the numbers, increase the participation and get more students involved. And I kind of hinted at this earlier about student voice, that more student centered approach. And this has really been an educational strategy that's really gained a lot of uh, traction for kind of increasing physical activity. Uh, we did some work uh, with a couple organizations around Title IX, around girls in motion, uh, around specifically addressing the, the needs of females and getting them more involved in physical activity and was very well received. So I'm really kind of starting to focus a lot of uh, our work in the organization on this, you know, component of student voice, student choice. How do we, you know, collect the values, the opinions, the perspectives of young people um, and really let them have a seat at the table and really offer their opinion and, you know, what they value. And I, I think the more as educators, we can give students that choice and control. I think, you know, there's opportunities for collaboration, then the greater their motivation and engagement is going to be. When we look at the environment, you know, again, I think it's about how we structure our programs and are we offering that variety of activities? Are we making it about all students and really um, having, you know, offerings that they're interested in that they can gain some success in? And then it's not that one size fits all approach. Uh, we focus on safety. Um, you know, we're providing, you know, activities that are age appropriate. And then also we're looking at the adults, we're looking at the teachers and are we providing enough adequate training, you know, with that our job embedded uh, type of professional learning that's going to help them to, uh, to do better for their students. And kind of that, that final bucket, I think, is relationships and, you know, how do we again, ensure that we're meeting the individual needs of all students. So even though I have a class of 35 students, I have some way, some opportunity, some method in place to find out about that student on an individual basis, their likes and their dislikes, and find some type of connection to improve that student-teacher relationship uh, in a positive environment. And, and that's probably the biggest thing I see is, you know, finding those, those teachers that provide and look for the positive and look for something that those young people do well. And it's okay if I'm not the highest skilled kid in class, um, but you know, what opportunities um, do are out there for me to participate in. And, you know, I think the more that we can be authentic and genuine in our caring and, you know, build our students self-confidence and self-esteem, again, the more successful that we're going to be. Um, utilizing peer relationships, I mentioned that with the one teacher that was using kind of peer-to-peer -peer program and kind of buddying up a, a student that was uh, very interested in physical activity, pairing them up with a more reluctant student that kind of was hesitant to participate in activity and uh, using that peer-to-peer -peer influence to kind of problem solve and, you know, um, give them some type of uh, choices when it comes to finding one thing in a class that they, they like to do. So I, I think we've got to lean more into kind of community partnerships. You know, I mentioned how powerful that is when you see consistent messaging from the school uh, to your out of school time sites, to your youth organizations. So giving opportunities for those leaders from those community organizations to see what's going on in school, to see what's important in the physical education program, to see what's important with family uh, engagement, and then being able to take that message uh, back, uh, I think it is, is so powerful. I think one question that anyone that works in education can ask students or ask themselves first is really about, you know, how do I get to know my students and their individual needs? I think this question kind of sums up, you know, everything that we just spoke about. And I think it's an important activity. It's really often overlooked, 
uh, because a lot of teachers have a pretty structured routine, pretty structured culture in their environment, and they don't deviate from that a lot. But, you know, I think determining student need and interest and kind of improving that relationship is really the initial step to kind of modifying a program to be more student focused and really ensure that it's meeting the needs of everybody providing some meaningful experience. Um, again, I, I see so many uh, teachers that are offering things because they're interested in it, not gathering, you know, that information from students. So when we talk about the third uh, strategy, you know, we talk about policy and really promoting physical activity policy, you know, being an advocate uh, for my programs, I think is, is a great place to start for, for educators um, because oftentimes, you know, family, community, I think they don't understand what's going on in the school. They don't understand the whole idea of physical activity in the, in the learning environment. Um, they often think that it's either sedentary type of learning or it's time for movement that the two can't go hand in hand. Um, so being able to show those connections that, no, it is possible uh, to integrate academic content with movement. Um, because when we're talking about policy, we're talking about things that, you know, it reaches a large percentage of the population. Um, you know, second, it kind of has to be sustainable and it can affect physical activity in many ways. But I think the most important thing is to consider it really requires a change in culture and in environment. And when I say culture, you know, often explain it as, you know, that's just kind of the way we do things here. Uh, that's a school, that's school culture. It's based upon our routines. And the best example I can give of this is, and here in my home state of Florida as a district administrator, uh, back in 2013, almost 10 years ago, uh, legislation passed a requirement for 150 minutes of elementary physical education. Now, this could be recess, could be, physical activity in the classroom. It could be PE time. So it didn't necessarily all have to be provided by a certified physical education teacher. On the outside, it, my initial thought, I was like, this is fantastic. This is great. We're making movement, getting some traction here with 150 minutes of, of elementary PE. Well, I'm scrambling around as a district administrator to kind of provide resources because most of our schools only had 60 or 90 minutes a week of physical education with a certified physical education teacher. Um, they had a 20 minute recess. So now we're looking at, you know, roughly about uh, 110 minutes. So they needed about 40 minutes more to meet this legislative requirement because the last thing we wanted to do, there was no money provided to hire additional physical education staff. So the last thing we wanted to do was start putting these three and four classes out in physical education uh, with one teacher and really turning that in now into more of a, a situation where you're just supervising instead of teaching. Excuse so, me, can you tell me uh, what legislative requirement you're referring to? In the state of Florida? Just in the state of Florida, okay. Yeah, this is in the, yeah, just within my home state of Florida back in, yeah, 2013. Um, that was 150 minutes of, of elementary PE. But the point quickly became schools were more so trying to circumvent, get around the legislation than actually complying with it. And, you know, um, getting resources out to teachers because that was going to kind of be the area uh, that we were going to have to make up that additional 40 minutes. Now we were talking about 40 minutes spread over, you know, five day period. Was it much for teachers to pick up? Um, but I quickly learned a valuable lesson because I got a call from the teachers union and they typically, they don't call again to tell you that things are going really great. Appreciate all the hard work you're doing around this new legislation. Uh, they called because they had an issue that classroom teachers at the elementary level were now calling them wanting to know if they could dress like physical educators since they were expected to be uh, providing physical education. So that was a kind of important learning moment for me because I realized that I missed developing the why, the benefit, how it's gonna benefit students, how it's gonna benefit kids. I jumped straight into the how of here's some resources, here's some activities, go do it. And it really forced me to kind of back up and say, you know, we've got to make this meaningful for adults as well, because we say this is in the best interest of kids. But again, when you're dealing with adult 
learners, you also have to provide that value, that benefit. How's it going to help me in my job as a third grade teacher if I have to provide 10 minutes a day of, of movement? So again, being able to add that value to it and that why uh, I learned is so important when you're talking about policy, um, policy language. So, you know, I think you have to kind of start with kind of building some support, again, getting someone in the building, leadership, uh, finding that physical activity champion, uh, getting that physical education teacher involved, getting students involved and families, uh, because again, it really comes down to the culture um, has to change in order for a policy to really be effective, because the next thing that we get into is, well, there's a policy, but then where's the enforcement? It becomes more of well, hey, the, you know, the state is doing this to me. It's really not in my, you know, best interest. This is just another rule that I have to follow. This is just something else I have to do um, because that culture is really kind of created through the way the, the adults in the building really, you know, their attitude, their behaviors, and really how the teachers build in routines. And I always, you know, think that's a, a unique challenge is when you're talking about changing a culture and build this kind of school-wide culture where movement, again, is, is the norm, um, is certainly a, a challenge. And I'll give you an example kind of from a national perspective. There's only one state that requires classroom physical activity breaks at the K-5 level, so at the elementary level. So we're not talking about physical education now. We're talking about just requiring teachers to get students up and moving during uh, the course of, uh, of their class. So one state has you know, a state requirement, Colorado, that requires this. When we look at school districts, and there's about 13, 14,000 school districts in the country, you know, do they have a policy? Because now a school district can develop a policy outside of, you know, a state legislation. It, it wouldn't necessarily have to be in place. And we're seeing about 11% of elementary um, schools that have some type of larger district policy in place that requires movement in the classroom. Now, we're seeing a lot more that are starting to recommend it where it's not necessarily in policy, but almost 50% of the schools uh, that we've seen are starting to develop some language where they'll say, you know, it's recommended that you provide students regular classroom physical activity uh, breaks throughout the day. And then when it trickles down to actual school level practice, um, where it happens regularly, we're seeing about 43% of elementary schools starting to incorporate uh, physical activity breaks into the, into the classroom. So again, moving from, you know, one state that actually has legislation around it to the number and percentage of about 11 districts nationwide have a policy around it to really, where is it just happening at? Um, so it's really, you know, opportunity to look and say, that, you know, does it necessarily have to be a policy in place for us to make it happen? Um, because if we know it, it's what's best for kids and, you know, it's gonna benefit students and teachers alike. Um, so just some things to think about, you know, as we're looking at data from state district uh, school level perspectives and really kind of highlight opportunities, you know, where we need to improve uh, those physical activity policies and practices. I thought it was interesting in this study, and this was from uh, Springboard to Active Schools. Um, they were finding about 64% of middle schools are starting to now integrate movement. I thought it was interesting because they put as the, the main reason at middle schools uh, where teachers were finding that it helped with behavior management uh, at the middle school age. So I thought that that was interesting that they were uh, seeing that as being a higher number than elementary schools because typically uh, we've struggled more at the secondary level to get the buy-in with physical activity in the classroom than we have with uh, elementary schools. So what's next? So as you kind of continue down this journey with this amazing work that you already have in place and these tools that you know that you already have in place, how can you continue to help schools really move down, you know, this path of, you know, CSPAP and, and developing this framework and, and utilizing these tools? And I think, you know, first of all, it's important, again, to remember that it's not that one size fits all approach. You got to encourage schools to start where they're at. Um, but again, you have to have some process in place really to identify those needs and really to 
take a look at what's going on already, what's working already, what haven't we tried, maybe where do we need some additional resources, because I like to provide schools with simple resources when we're talking about movement in the school day. I don't think it requires a, a lot of equipment. Uh, again, some of the best ideas, again, are, are free. They're simple type of ideas. We have a whole uh, resource database and action center um, that schools can access. Everything that we do, again, is uh, uh, no cost to schools as far as resources and, you know, um, having something that educators are comfortable with is the key, it's something that meets their needs. Um, because if I don't have a comfort level with physical activity, me getting to, you know, work with students and really display some type of enthusiasm uh, is very difficult if I'm not comfortable with with movement myself. So, you know, take a look at, you know, building support, you know, getting other folks on board, start with that one teacher, find that one classroom, that one third grade teacher that has this, you know, belief that, you know, movement can really help and benefit young people and can benefit the adults on campus and then build it out from there. Start with one classroom. It turns into, a, you know, one grade level. Now it turns into a wing and then, you know, pretty soon it's pervasive throughout the school. Are there training needs? Uh, because again, don't think that you can just pass out notebooks and binders with lots of different activities in it that teachers are automatically going to do it. Um, I found the best things that work uh, when we work with schools is giving them that hands-on opportunity to you know, participate in short little physical activity breaks. When they see that it's fun, then they're more likely to do it and that it's not hard, doesn't require a lot of equipment, doesn't take up time or a lot of space. Um, so, you know, an excellent way to kind of implement this type of ideas in faculty meetings, you know, build in movement breaks during a faculty meeting when you're sitting there for long periods of time and really get teachers to understand that, you know, integrating movement in the day is, is not that difficult. You know, the big thing is really changing that culture, really looking at that environment. Um, but, you know, I found the people that are positive that, you know, look for those little tidbits of success and they share that out. Uh, no matter how small, um, really have, you know, success in changing a culture. And then finally, you know, look for opportunities to collect that data. You know, it may be for an individual teacher, you know, how many opportunities were there throughout the school day for a student to move? As a physical education teacher, you know, is there a difference, between, you know, with students that have 90 minutes of physical education a week compared to 60 minutes? Um, so what are some simple ways that I can look for data? It doesn't have to be a, a super in-depth study. It could be simple ways to find and, and look for those little tidbits and then maybe start connecting some academic connections uh, with that as well. So just kind of as we wrap up here, you know, I just want you to think about this one question because, you know, we talk about all the time about starting with the end in mind. But I would challenge educators in a specific school to say, all right, let's start with the end in mind. Think about this question. If all students at your school were more physically active, how would your school be different? And it's okay if you say, oh, it, it would be complete chaos. There would be kids that are out of control. My administrator would think that, you know, I can't control my classroom. Um, that's okay to get those types of responses because those are the individuals that you're going to have to bring on board if you're really going to change that environment and change that culture. Um, so ask that question, which is really, you know, is what we're here for is to provide and, you know, increase those opportunities for students to move and provide a more active learning environment where the school is really this hub of physical activity before, during, and after the school day. So if we know what that looks like and I can envision it, then how do, how do we kind of bring that to life? So just in leaving you today, um, when you look at this group of letters, you know, what do you see? You know, where do you put the spaces at? And feel free to come off mute and share. What do you see when you read those letters? I'll help you out. It's either opportunity is nowhere. nowhere, but I'm really hoping that you see that, you know, opportunity is now here um, because your attitude, you know, really does make all of the difference uh, when we're talking about, you know, putting a, a comprehensive school physical activity program into place. Again, tools, resources, they're fantastic, um, really need them, but more importantly, it's the individuals on campus that make the difference, making that connection with that school physical activity champion, you know, that, that one school leader um, 
whether it be in a classroom, whether it be in that main office that could really make a difference. So um, I appreciate the time today. I'm going to open it up now for uh, any type of questions that you may have and feel free to put those in the chat box or feel free to come off mute as well. Yeah, I see that now. Um, thank you. Opportunity is now here that um, Amy Pearson put in there. Yeah, thank you. But anybody have any great things going on in, in their school environment or things that they've seen um, that they've really kind of hung on to that really helped uh, get things kind of started? I, I would love to hear ideas uh, from you all as well. Uh, I had a concern I wanted to bring up. I was, I got here all late. Um, I had to help with my school's uh, bus duty, but uh, did you cover talk about um, recess and stuff like that? I know that's one issue I have at my school. Yeah, um, we were talking about recesses. Yeah, it's being built in that opportunity, yeah. you know, that happens, you know, throughout the school day. Um, yeah, I, I think that's certainly an area as a physical educator that you can kind of step in and provide some guidance to, because I think oftentimes where we see issues with recess is the fact that teachers think it's a break for them. So they bring their classes out and they turn them loose and there's really no structure involved. So, uh, you know, as, as much as we talk about, it's important for young people to have unstructured playtime. I think there's ways that you can structure recess and build in that student, you know, choice where there's choices of different types of activities and it doesn't just turn into, hey, it's a big free for all and turn five, you know, classes loose on the field. Is that the type of strategy you're talking about, Tom? Uh, I was just wondering about kind of like advocating for recess because I know like my um, here, everyone gets um, half hour of recess a day, which is, I guess, better than a lot of schools, I guess, but then our third grade, only has 15 a day and then they struggle like the whole third grade classes they just struggle with management and a lot, a lot of behavior and so like they're just they're pretty out of control and so I know that's something I think they need more of that and so uh, I've had a conversation with our principal about um, just the, thinking they need more recess and then I've talked with some of the, uh, the three third grade teachers we have and just about what they've been doing this year and what they think they need. And I think a lot of them are on board with um, needing more recess. And so I think they were gonna have a PLC together with the uh, principal and kind of bring that up. Um, but I was just wondering, you know, advice for advocating for recess and really communicating the importance of that to administration. Cause a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't uh, see that importance yet. And you just see it as like, oh, a break or whatever. Um, I think, you know, I think it's really important you know having it a structured time in the day where it's like you you know you're not going to be taken away for lunch or during because like or during our lunches uh some of the students you know they're messing around and they're like okay we're taking a recess tomorrow and i'm like that's not okay i don't think they should be doing that so i want to just help with um letting the administration understand the importance of it and just you know you know just keeping it i don't know Making, making sure the students are getting what they need. So. Yeah, no, those those are all great points, Tom, and you're exactly right. And um, yeah, I've got some great resources I can, you know, share with you if you want to shoot me an email around, you know, the importance of recess and also the importance of not taking recess away because, you know, in my experience as administrator, you walk out there and you'd see the same kids are sitting by the fence every day that were pulled out of recess. And, you know, I'd always ask the teachers, well, it's not working. It's the same kids. So can we, yeah. you know, try something else with kids. Um, lots of um, interesting ideas around moving recess now, because traditionally it's always been after lunch. Um, but food and nutrition staff have been on board uh, for several years now advocating for recess before lunch because they're finding that students actually um, eat more and they're, they're consuming more of their uh, food because they're not in such a hurry to finish eating and to, to get outside. So simple ideas like that. Um, but again, I think it really starts 
that's an opportunity, I think, for training for whoever your recess supervisors are. You know, there's organizations like Playworks um, that have a lot of different resources, some free online trainings. You know, again, I think if you think about the way that you structure your physical education classes and you know, can you take some of those same concepts and apply to a recess where there's different activity areas that have different activities going on that students can choose from? And then you have monitors that are there, you know, to to help with the uh, discipline piece of it. But I, I found I think the more that you provide some structure, some guidance that young people expect some structure, it's when you kind of turn them loose in those free for all type of uh free play that you end up getting some discipline issues that, you know, you kind of have to provide some structure, but I also think it's a way to provide some training for um, your, uh, your staff that's going to be out there actually in charge of recess um, is, a, is, is a great thing. But yeah, I'd be glad to share some, a lot of, you know, different resources that we have that you could use. Um, and I'll share my email address on this next slide. Uh, yeah, but great question though. Thank you. Yeah, someone asked um, in the choir, federal government sets requirements for nutrition in schools. Don't we need federal requirements for physical education instead of suggestions? Um, yeah, and I think the issue there, I think, is the funding piece of it of providing more teachers. And we've kind of had this discussion in our uh, planning time is that, you know, then states typically fund you know education when it comes to personnel but the time piece of it i think is kind of a slippery slope because yes we need more time but along with that i think if the funding is not there to hire the additional staff to provide that time then we lose you know physical education kind of becomes watered down and i think a you know a great way for physical education teachers because they worry about time. But then I've also seen, you know, physical education teachers that were not their best advocate for the field and, you know, giving them more time would have just, you know, not really been beneficial to students. Um, so I always challenge physical education teachers, you know, what are you doing with the time that you have now? What, you know, resources, what accountability measures, what evidence do you have that, you know, more time would lead to, to better, you know, to better outcomes for young people. Um, so yeah, great question. Again, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, again, different states, you know, if you go to the Shape America website, you can look, um, they have an annual kind of state of physical education, physical activity, and you can pull up all 50 states and it gives you kind of their requirements around physical education, health education, physical activity. Um, but yeah, that's a kind of a, a great way to, to look at it about what's going on with the, with the different states and to kind of really stay involved with what's, you know, currently happening in your state. Hey, Sean, I have a question. Uh, yes, my name sir. is Bill Brandmeier. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for your time and thanks for sharing. Um, I, I, I run a nonprofit foundation that is trying to support schools. Um, do, do you have any background or any information on how you might engage with, with outside organizations that want to help uh, phys, phys ed within schools to um, administer uh, physical activity for kids, exercise, um, specialized training? Uh, skill development outside of the constructs of of the school administration or curriculum that's been written. Yeah, it's it's really about you know making connections, like you said, with those kind of like minded organizations that have um, you know those goals in mind. You know, I think by certainly being part of you know your state. Uh, organization with Shape America, you know, is a great way to go. Attending those state conferences, really getting out in the field and to see who the who the leaders are in your state around physical education, making connections. Well, each state has a, a president and a, a, a board with uh, Shape America, which is again our national organization. Um, so I think that's really the probably the first step is really you have to identify who those leaders are at the school district and state level, you know, your state coordinator of health and physical education uh, with the Missouri Department of Ed or uh, Kansas Department of Ed would be a great place to start as well, because they can kind of point you in that direction. Because oftentimes, I think what you'll see in a community is you'll see um, a lot of people are working really, really hard 
kind of on the same things, but then no one really knows what the other organization is doing. And there's really no kind of process in place to really bring those organizations together. So, uh, you know, I think you have to kind of start at the top and then work down. So I would recommend again, looking at your state uh, shape board, um, your state shape president, and then also your uh, department of ed contacts as well is a great place to start, Bill. But thanks for the question, that's great. Yep, thank you, Katie, for sharing that in the chat box with the with the advocacy uh, resources. As sort of a follow up to that, and a comment that's in the chat that um, talks about engaging parents and contacting parents in the I think it was the Conference of School Physical Activity Program model. It includes before and after school physical activity. Mm -hmm. How is how, if at all, is that counted toward the number of minutes that kids should be active during the school day, since it's technically outside of the school day, but it could be happening at school? Yeah, yeah. And when yeah, when we look at a national recommendation, the national recommendation is sixty minutes daily of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, so it, that necessarily wouldn't have to be during the actual school you know, seven and a half, eight hours that you're actually in school. So those physical activity programs um, may be, you know, if a school doesn't have a strong physical education program, that may be an opportunity to get students that 60 minutes of time. And the good thing about it, it doesn't have to be you know, 60 consecutive minutes. So that's what I was saying, if, if a young person, you know, if there's a before school physical activity program where as soon as they show up on campus, they're involved in physical activity um, for, 15 minutes before the school day, they go to recess for 20 minutes, and then they have a physical education class for, you know, 30 minutes, you know, now those those youth are getting that recommended 60 minutes a day. So, you know, I think you have to kind of look at it as a daily requirement, not necessarily as a it has to occur during the school day type requirement. And sort of this is semi-related to that, but my question, and Sean, I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm wondering if anybody else who works in schools can answer it as well. Who has more influence in schools in terms of implementing practices? So, you know, you, you mentioned the difference between policy and practice, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's okay, to, you know, we should just start with the practice because we can do that without having the policy in place. So who has more influence, teachers, students, or the parents and family? So I'm thinking of who needs, who else besides teachers can be advocating or is it just teachers that are the most important? That, that's a great question, Shelly. That'd be a great Mentimeter question if I could get it to work all the time. <laughs> um, but I'm going to, I would take a stab at it and I would love to hear others thoughts as well, but I'm going to say out of all of those, I think that family piece, parents, um, are very powerful advocates. Um, and I will go a step further and saying that students as well with their family are best advocates. Um, we worked with New York City Schools on a, a large initiative called um, Move to Improve. And it, it was only for K-5 schools. Well, after six or seven years, when those elementary students were going into middle school, um, they had been involved in, in movement uh, in their classrooms all through K-5. They got to middle school and they were back to sedentary, sitting there again. They became their own best advocates because you know they were saying, hey, we're used to moving. We're not used to, to sitting still. So I'm gonna go with, uh, with choice C, family engagement, and then throw in the caveat all the students, but would be glad to, you know, would love to hear others' opinions as well on that one. Well, I'd like to pike in for this because, uh, I don't know, I'm a foreigner and I was, um, I'm active um, in the United States a little bit because I work here, but uh, I'm active on some Facebook groups overseas and I was interviewed by somebody that, uh, is running a physical education channel overseas. And I was explaining to him about the uh, uh, requirements for, for Kansas kids, how they participate in physical education, how uh, in elementary K through five, we have about on average 60 minutes. And then in middle school, it shifts in sixth grade, shifts into 60 minutes, five times a, 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 five times a week, which is six times, that's 300 minutes. And in seventh grade, it goes into just one semester, 300 minutes. And then the other semester, there's 
zero. Um, so my question, and then in high school, of course, like your chart said, it probably goes down again. There's probably just the kind of stuff that is uh, voluntary or whatever. So would you be able to tell us um, how, it, how would state go about streamlining this thing? Because obviously it just goes up and down like a roller coaster with no straightforward way. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. If you look at, you know, again, I'll go back to students because if you look at, you know, if, if any of you are K-5 elementary teachers, probably the one thing that you don't have an issue with is that participation problem that, uh, you know, that I was hitting on because, again, you're the physical educator on that elementary campus and you're an automatically a rock star. I mean, those kindergartners show up, they don't even know what physical education is, but they love you, right? They, they want to be there in your class. So they have this just this crazy love of movement. But then I always ask, what happens? I mean, what happens to, to kids where, as you mentioned, we're getting into middle school and all of a sudden they don't want to participate anymore. So, you know, I go back to looking at how we're structuring programs at the middle school, at the high school level um, for kids, because somewhere along the line, and if you can answer that question, you know, you, you could write a book on it, but, um, you know, why are we losing that, that love of movement? But you're right, our our requirements typically in states kind of match up with that though, right? That daily physical education, elementary, maybe a semester at the middle school, you get to the high school and it's one credit and I take it in my ninth grade year and then I don't ever, you know, go into physical education again. Um, so again, those are just, you know, questions, you know, for your department of ed, because again, we all have, you know, requirements, um, you know, from the state level that guide, you know, kind of what we can do in schools. And, you know, those are just bigger decisions that have to be, you know, advocated for. But again, your state organizations are great places because I assure you, they already have somebody that's kind of working in that area that already knows, you know, what's gone on, what's the history behind it? Has there ever been, you know, legislation introduced? What were some of the hangups about it? And it, again, it's a great way to get in involved with your professional uh, organizations at that state advocacy level. Yes, uh, <laughs> Shelly, that's a, yeah, that one, um, it could be, yeah, definitely could be, you know, is puberty the reason physical activity decreases, you know, kids start to smell and they sweat, hair is messed up. Yeah, boys are starting to notice girls more often. Yeah, those things, they're worried about their appearance. Um, yeah, those certainly probably go into, um, go into play. And I'll throw one more out there that happens at the secondary school that doesn't happen at elementary school. But when we are requiring kids to change clothes, um, for physical education at the secondary level, that is totally different for them than the elementary level. Um, and I could, you could talk me into both ways on this one, because I can see both sides of the stories because I, it's two separate groups. You have a group of physical education teachers that say, no, they're going to stink. I'm not going to send them to class because they're sweating. And then you've got other physical educators that say, look, if the goal is my program is to get more kids involved in movement then really, if they are comfortable participating in, you know, what they have on, as long as they've got some footwear on and that they can participate in safely, isn't it okay if they don't have to change clothes? And, you know, I'm starting to see that more and more um, because, you know, again, we're the only content area that requires kids to change clothes and, you know, in, to, in order to, to participate. And you're starting to see issues with, you know, real issues with, you know, kids that aren't comfortable changing in front of other kids, those type of issues, locker room, um, you know, supervision. Um, so I think it's really, you have to go back to what's the goal of my program and I always challenge physical educators to develop a goal. What do you want kids to be able to know and do? What's the big idea? And really, if you look at all our national standards, if you look at your state standards, it's really about learning to like physical activity, to become physical literate. And in order to do that, you've got to, you've got to participate. And am I turning some kids off because I'm making them go change clothes? So I think those are real questions for, for physical educators to address.
great discussions. Uh, anybody else have any questions? I know um, we've got different things scheduled. I just wanted to share a um, a slide. You know, just again, you know, thanks for uh, inviting me here to this. I would love to again, you know, um, Shelley to be to be involved in any type of future work you've got moving forward. But this is just a QR code that goes to just kind of a brief survey about today's presentation, and hopefully the the information was was useful to you. But feel free to copy down my email address. I know Tom, you mentioned, um, but just shoot me a quick email and I'll send you uh, some different resources that we have on recess. Uh, but if, you know, if I can help you out in any way, you know, please do again, this is what, you know, I've been involved with my entire career. This is what I'm passionate about. And, um, you know, again, I just thank you for your time because your commitment to be at a session and event like something like this today, you know, just speaks volume where you're at with your own professional learning and you wanting to, you know, improve your program, but then also, you know, advocate for the field as well. So. Thanks, Sean. We really appreciate you joining us today, especially considered <laughs> considering your circumstances. And yeah, I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back to our hurricane. If I <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Well, stay but, safe. And thanks again for sharing your resources and such great information. Yep, I certainly will. Thank you all again so much. And uh, uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Sounds Thank good. You. So for the rest of you, if you're still able to join us, we plan to continue this discussion after a short physical activity break. We do believe in role modeling. And so we'd like to include a physical activity break in all of the sessions that we have. Um, I'll start that in just a second. I'll start sharing my screen. But for those of you who haven't joined us before, um, this work is the school sector of the Kansas City Physical Activity Plan. And we are actively trying to figure out how we take the strategies that have been identified uh, for this sector in terms of how, how, how we increase rates of physical activity among kids at school, how we take those strategies and put them into action. So that's gonna be the next phase of our discussion. I would invite all of you to join us after we take um, a short physical activity break, and then we'll give you all another couple of minutes to take a, take a break for any other needs that you have. So um, I hope you can share my screen and I hope, hmm, this may not work. Katie didn't think about this. Yeah, um, that was my bad. I've been having it pulled up in the past, so I can go ahead and share my screen. I've got the video pulled up. Perfect. Okay, perfect. That's great. exercises and some stretches for you guys. Uh, most of these can be done while you're sitting or while you're standing. So let's get right into it. The first one we're going to do, we're going to lock our fingers and we're going to stretch all the way up to the ceiling. Try to touch the stars, get on your tiptoes a little bit, and then we're going to bring our arms down right behind our neck. Bring our elbows in and let's rock back and forth. Right, left, right, left. Good job. All right, back up to the starting position. And now let's get some head circles in. You might hear some cracks, that's okay. Good, and now let's get our whole body involved and let's shake things out a little bit. Get ready for some of these main stretches. Awesome. Let's bring our arms up and we're gonna do some core twists. We want to get a little bit of a wider stance. We're going to go left, right. Nice rock solid. Perfect. All right, and all this can be done uh, in a seated position as well. It would be this type of variation. And we're going to move on to the next drill. So we're going to do some knee pulls. We'll start with our right. You want to grab right below the knee, pull up towards our chest, hold it for about five seconds. It's okay if you lose your balance, find something next to you, find a table or a chair. You can hold your balance just like that. If you're seated, you can do this variation. Back to our right leg. Good job. 
All right, and then we're gonna transition to some toe touches. Touch our right toe. Try to hold that for about five seconds. If you can't touch your toe, that's totally fine. Just touch somewhere in your shin. See how far you can get down. Three, two, one. Awesome. If we're standing, it's gonna look like this. See how far you can get down that shin. Try to touch your toes. Awesome. Nice and controlled. We can focus on our breathing in through our nose. Out through our mouth. All right, we'll do a quick hamstring stretch now. Our right leg, we're gonna reach down, grab that foot, pull up towards our butt. Good, hold for about five seconds. Awesome, left side. Two, one, good job. If you're in the seated position, it looks about like this. Get a good stretch in. If you're not able to grab your foot, that's okay. The variation would just be leaning back and trying to reach down with your hand as far as you can. Good, all right, on to the next one. We're gonna get a glute stretch in now. We're, uh, when we're sitting all day at home, this is a good stretch to make sure that things are activated, our big muscles in our body are activated um, while we're sitting down. So we're gonna bring our right leg up, set our ankle on our leg. We can lean forward for a better stretch, hold it and then we can lift up on that leg just slightly. Good, we'll go to the other leg. If you're standing up, it looks something like this. Good, lift it up a little. Okay, and our last one, let's connect our fingers again. Let's reach to the stars and let's slowly flow down into a forward fold. Grab those elbows, we can sway to the left and the right, left. Right, sitting down, looks like this. Left, right, and good. There we go, guys. Thanks for joining me. These are all exercises you can do at home. And as we're sitting at home, if you're working from home or in a seated position throughout the day, um, these are fantastic ways to get moving in an easily accessible way. Thanks. Thank you all for joining us in that. We're gonna give you um, just another minute or two and I'm gonna pull my screen up again. If you need to take another break, we'll have some questions to um, guide our discussion. Okay, can you all see my screen? Great, so um, we are really pleased that we were able to have Sean join us today and talk a little bit about how we might better support physical activity in schools. Just as a reminder for this group, he talked about them at the very beginning, but the strategies that have already been, been identified for the school sector for our physical activity plan are around, you. Uh, adoption of the comprehensive school physical activity program model about professional development and training. So providing training and professional development to prepare educators to deliver effective physical activity programs for all students. And then advocating for policies that promote physical activity among all students. So in order to help us think about how we can better do that together, we we came up with a few questions to sort of guide our discussion. And this is really just gonna be an open conversation. So I'd like, I'd like you all to think about, we don't have to go in any particular order, but I'd like you to think about what are some of the barriers that you currently see within, most of you are within schools, but some are within other settings, within your organization when trying to implement act, physical activity programs and plans. And this might be different depending on the time of day. Like, is it during the school day? Is it before and after school? 
Um, in your opinion, what are some of the best practices for physical activity in school setting that we can help um, share with others? Is there a project or program that you think has the potential for expansion? If so, how can we help? Is there a potential for high impact? And if so, how can we help? Um, can any of the programs you're currently running benefit from resources we can offer? And in terms of professional development, I'd like you to think about what opportunities you either have available or would be beneficial uh, for you in your current roles. So one of the things I think about is we provided this opportunity. So sharing an expert from uh, an organization that supports schools, but if there are continuing education requirements for some of you, we, we didn't do that yet. Should we be doing that? And if so, what are the ones that are meaningful for you? So I'm just going to pause for a second and see if you all have any questions or want to have some ideas for just starting the conversation. I, I do have an idea that I've been playing in my head for a while, and that is the um, integrating more frequent recess into schools. I know there are some um, school districts in the country that are playing with the idea that uh, are letting kids go um, every hour, kind of like 50-10 approach, uh, um, academic 50 minutes and, and um, play time for 10, 15 minutes. Um, I know there's there is something going on in the state of Texas. I think there's some research going on at Baylor. Um, I can't really think of that uh, initiative, but I can look it up. Uh, um, that's just something on the top of my head that I was thinking about. I think that's a great idea. I think, They've started uh, doing it within the work setting. And if adults need it, I mean, I would expect that kid, it would be more beneficial for kids. I think going off of what Euro said about the recess, I think, um, so bringing like that to that research you're talking about, like we need to bring that up, not just so that we understand it, but that, you know, an administration sees that because um, just like our speaker was saying with students, 20% uh, of the students you see, they're going to be active in PE. Those aren't the students we need to be um, worried about. So in our situation, we don't need to worry about us. We understand um, kind of our, our side. So we need the rest of the school administration to understand and, and teachers um, the importance of what we're doing. And so I think uh, when you talk about professional development opportunities, I think focusing maybe on um, the other classroom teachers and school administration on physical activity, uh, professional development stuff so that they understand the importance of that. And also then how it relates to learning. So with like the recess, um, 10 minutes every hour, like um, when it comes to learning, like you need those decompressive kind of uh, decompressive times to kind of learn because you can't just always have your brain on all day learning stuff you gotta you know learn relax learn relax you know and so that's where recess comes in the frequent re recess and breaks and stuff and so i'm just yeah jumping off of what euro said it's kind of my thoughts on that so on that point how so let me you can see from my name that i work at children's mercy mm -hmm. how would we do that how would we get to school administrators to provide this information and professional development how would we get to other classroom teachers to share this information well in our district it's it's quite complicated because the uh, administrators are really tied with uh, with the state requirements and uh, as far as i know uh, the schools are limited providing this recess opportunity for the kids because there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, instructional minutes that are required. Um, so the uh, 
administrator's hands are pretty tied with as far as this. So I think I think you would have to start on the top. <clears throat> I don't know how. Right. I mean, so we have like, yeah, I mean, in terms of getting professional development, I don't know how we would um, implement that. I don't, like we have our professional development every, you know, every Wednesday at this time. So, you know, district wide. And so um, we would have to find a way to add that into professional development for administration and classroom teachers. Um, I don't know how to, how we would go, go, go about that. Um, well, that's one of the reasons I asked about who has the most influence in schools. So maybe we should be targeting parents for part of this to advocate for more physical activity, which might then, if we're also offering professional development opportunities at the same time, what are your thoughts on our chances of getting in that way? Yeah, I think it would be parents. Uh, it would be uh, um, legislators and superintendents. I, I think school board. I think I think our there's tons of research that tons of research that that supports everything that we want to do. Yet, as Euro said, we're just not getting the minutes. We've gone from 60 minutes a week to 50. We're going the wrong direction for activity. And it, it when it comes to nutrition, the federal government provides very strict standards and the schools provide those strict standard meals but when it comes to physical activity we just think it's going to happen and it's not i know uh, i was talking to one of our third grade teachers at my school a few weeks ago about the recess deal here and she was saying uh I mean, this is her first year back for a few years. She was retired and then came back this year. But she was saying back when she was teaching, uh, she went to the school board. Uh, I don't know for what issue, but she was trying to get something changed. And, and they just told her, you know, we, you know, we're not going to do anything unless, you know, the parents come here and they give their input and they ask for this. And so I think going off of the, the family thing is 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 the most, you know, the, the priority. Um, students and, and family. I know with, at least in my building, I mean, we have a little, we struggle a little bit with getting that parental and family involvement. And so um, that might be a struggle, but I'm sure, you know, I could find at least a few parents that would advocate for it and, and help out with it. But. I have a question too. If, um, if there were, if we were to get more recess, is that going to be on the teachers' backs to be out, you know, um, monitoring the students? So I don't know how recess is done in every district, but I guess thinking, of course, we definitely would want teachers in, on board with that. Or if it's not a recess, recess, but it's like they finish up their time and they get 10 minutes to be um, active. So outside, have, inside, what like, that looks like. At my school, like, I know, I think doing like before, like before school stuff, like, you know, because students can get here at 830, but then I guess they don't go to their classroom till a little before nine or so, um, maybe about nine. And so I don't know, doing before school, like, you know, maybe they can go out and, you know, basically have recess before school before they have to be in their classroom. Because right now, I think they just sit in the gym okay. and, and then get their, um, then get their breakfast. So I don't know if they eat breakfast before they go to the classroom. Or, or there's a way we could implement something like that. So it's not in the instructional time of the day, but you can still fit in physical like activity walk -in, at the school. Walk and talk or something like in the morning before when they get there. Because you all don't start, you have structure like um, staggered starts based on school, school buildings. Some start earlier and some start. It's just different. for elementary, is it all around nine that they start? Uh, some started nine. Some started, uh, I think, eight eight thirty.
The other thing I want to throw out here is um, with the physical activity plan, the with the Kansas City Regional Physical Activity Plan that we've been starting, we have eight other societal sectors that are active and have identified strategies and tactics that if they were fully implemented would increase rates of physical activity among Kansas Cityans. A few of those other sectors that sort of relate to schools are sport, um, parks and recreation, and infrastructure. So sport would be like sport programming, youth sport programming, whether it's offered through Parks and Rec or some other organization that supports it. I see Lee Kurtick on, who is here from Girls on the Run, an after school program, you know, specifically targeting girls, but still something that's offered and oftentimes is held at schools. Uh, parks and Recreation frequently provide before and after school programming. Not in every district, but sometimes it's the YMCA, which is another community community organization that supports recreation. And then infrastructure, because it relates to active transportation and walking or biking to and from school or safe routes to school or, or uh, walking school bus programs like that. Are there, do you all have thoughts and experience? Um, let me see, how do I wanna ask this question? Based on those different sectors or those other sectors, are there opportunities that you think we should be taking advantage of to identify cross-sector projects or programs that, mean, that we might want to get started or um, make available at your schools or other settings so that parents are more aware of the physical activity opportunities and see the benefit of physical activity for their kids in a variety of ways, getting outside mental health, not just the, you know, physical benefits that you might see, um, and then have them understand how important they are in terms of advocating for it within a school day. Shelly, I would add from Girls on the Row, oh, Pam, I, I interrupted you. You're fine, Lee, you're yeah. fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, you know, we are not typically integrated into the school day, but wonderful people like Pam, um, our coaches after school for the program. One thing I would say I really appreciate um, from Sean's presentation is that so much of what he talked about really aligns with Girls on the Run when we talk about kids participate when they feel confident. And that's something that we really stress at Girls on the Run. Peer influence, same thing. Girls are coming together after school with their friends. We're engaging families. We talk about high quality teachers. We get amazing coaches that will mentor girls. Um, and I think all of we're integrating learning, social emotional learning along with movement. So I think our program just naturally hits a lot of the things that Sean was talking about. Um, and that could be one way to add some movement into the schools and an after school program. Um, and as far as sponsorship or cost is concerned, yes, there is a fee to participate, but we do provide scholarships to half of our girls. So know that that is an option too, if you think, um, dollars or the, the registration would fee would be a financial barrier. So we could be a resource to all of you. Pam, were you going to share something as well? Oh, no, I just was going to say, I know in the past sometimes, just nothing has gone home this year, but I know in KCK, like Parks and Rec or Wyandotte, I don't know, county, 
sports, they usually send home flyers for the kids, you know, to do basketball, soccer, cheerleading, whatever, um, just to make sure that all buildings are getting those also. Or even if it's even having coaches come out and do little clinics at the school so the kids actually see what it is that they would be doing with that activity. Because um, I think sometimes those don't always you know, it's just a piece, it's a piece of paper they're taking home. They, but if it was more that they saw what it was about, it would have a bigger impact. But so I don't know, that's just one thing. I don't know that all buildings get all those all of the, all of the time. So I don't know how that really works. Yeah, and we've heard specifically that there's difficulty getting the flyers to the district and then and then from the district to the building and then from the building to the student. So we've been trying to explore other options for helping to get the word out about activities that are going on and we just don't know what's best. Um, and in fact, I mean, we don't sit within school settings. So that's where your expertise to inform the direction we're trying to go is so valuable because we might think we know what's important related to being physically active, but if we don't work directly with kids or understand all the barriers within schools and the district and policies and all those things, what we come up with may be, may not be valuable or actually change anything. So we don't expect to have all the answers today, but we do want to make all of you aware that we are actively hoping to make a difference in the Kansas City Metro and really value your feedback. So I really wanna thank you all for participating in the conversation today and invite you to sign up for the school sector. And by signing up, um, we don't ask much out of you. <laughs> we really are simply looking for your feedback and participation whenever possible. So if you identify a great topic for us to share in terms of um, information, hosting a webinar again, sort of like what we did today, please send that. We'd love to find an offer, find a way to do that. We have uh, physicians specifically in our sports medicine department here who are really interested in this topic and excited to provide information, expertise, where it's most valuable. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter. We send out a monthly newsletter. It shares updates on implementation projects that we're trying to establish. Uh, you'd be able to inform those. If you have some great ideas, it provides other information and resources that might be valuable related to being active in schools. In fact, right now, what we promoted in the month of September is Walktober. So we're trying to get the word out about all the walk to school day events that are taking place, trying to connect that to other walking events that are taking place across the communities in the month of October and use that to help families um, engage a little bit more in uh, physical activity. So again, really easy to do. Katie, I think maybe dropping that in the chat. Um, not entirely sure. Uh oh. Katie seems to be um, having a little technical difficulty here. Uh, let's see. Let me see if anyone else is on that might be able to drop that information. I apologize. Give me one moment. I just switched from my phone to a different computer. Okay. No problem. I think I, think I can do it. I found the take part. I'll try it and see. Okay, guys. Great. We would invite any of you to participate in our monthly sector meetings. We hold them on the fourth Wednesday. Although, you know, the bad thing for this group is they might be during the school day or when you have other things that are already going on. Um, Robin, can you remind me what's our typical time? Is it is it this time or is, is it 2 to 3.30 or is it later? We have done, uh, I think, I want to say 2 to 3.30, but if we need to look at that adjustment, I mean, you know, it's something that we definitely can look at doing, um, adjusting it to a little bit later or if, and, and even having feedback if, if as teachers, as you all are, if you're interested and you're like, you know, if we could do it from this time to this time, because I know some of you may coach as well um, outside um, after school, we welcome any insights that might 
help <laughs> help with that too. But we have been doing a two to three thirty, kind of during knowing that that's some of your um, time for your your professional development time as well. When Christine has helped us with that. Um, yeah. One other thing I was going to ask, and this would be just something that, as we were talking about um, sharing information with parents and things, do you think? Uh, let's say if we were working with Lee on um, Girls on the Run or maybe a Parks and Rec program, if there was a QR code that could be included in a newsletter that had a little short video about, hey, this is something that's available, uh, would that be something? I don't know how um, information goes out to um, students necessarily from in every building, but if there's something like that that we could even work on or for even for you all, um, as if many of your PE teachers, if there's a way to for us to share information that way with you too. If that's, I'm just wondering what, if that's an easy way too, because I know a lot of people watch videos <laughs> and the whole TikTok um, craze and, and different things. Not that I'd be the one making them, but if we had some options or some ideas that way too, possibly. I would add Robin that, we do weekly emails to our parents during the season, telling them what their girls are learning so they can, hopefully we can work on that family engagement piece where they can have um, questions and engage in dialogue. But if there's anything, I guess, from the physical activity group that we could share with them, that could be added to that weekly email as a resource. Hey, that would um, that'd be great to know that's an option. And maybe as we put together information of just as we start looking at some of the, you know, research or if there's a way to put it in a, you know, kind of package it in a very uh, easy to understand way of, you know, check these things out, maybe ask your school or maybe, you know, just in a, an easy way for parents too. And, um, but I, that is nice to hear too, especially hearing from our participants today about that family support and then knowing if some things are going out to families, um, how do we work that? So that's just something for us to work on, but we welcome everybody's help <laughs> and everybody because you all work in little different settings and can bring um, definitely a lot of um, great insights too. And I know that um, Katie just added to the chat about the physical activity summit that is tomorrow morning. So if um, any of you are able to join us, we welcome that. Um, it'll be a little bit different than today, but very simple. But we'll have a lot of great insights to be shared as well. And then we're going to, we'll be um, sharing out about our, our event today as, as well as the other sectors we'll be sharing about what ha has happened at their sector events this last month. Okay. So the last thing in terms of wrapping up is an evaluation. So I know Sean um, asked you to fill an evaluation out for him as well, specific to his presentation. This QR code, you can simply scan it and it'll take you straight to our evaluation, which is very short, but it does offer you a place to sign up to participate in uh, the sectors. And again, by participation, it can be as much or as little as you want. You'll get information on a monthly basis related to each of the different sectors or whichever ones you sign up for. If it's just for the school's one, we generally send out a monthly newsletter and invitations to participate in our sector meetings. So it's not just a ton, um, but we're always, we'd love your feedback in terms of content, other resources we need to share or other resources you are looking for. We do read them. We do make changes based on them. So I invite you all to take a few minutes to complete that and help us continue to improve what we're doing here. So with that, I wanna thank you all again for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate your participation. Your expertise is invaluable to this work and uh, I hope to see you at future meetings. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone.
Shelly. Yes. Um, I don't have control anymore, but uh, if you want to stop the recording. <laughs>